Could we have our readers come forward now? We're doing something slightly unusual for the sermon for today for All Saints. I put out a call about a month ago for people with memories of Christ Church to write me a story, not something that was big or a giant event or you know, a time when we threw a huge party, but the little moments of love and connection that make life worth living and make a church a home. So I've collected some of them. Uh, You're going to hear a series of readers. Uh, People will not be reading their own memories. They're reading other folks' memories. And then I will close us out with just a few thoughts. But what I invite you to do is to listen for God in all of these stories, to hear how Christ's love has been proclaimed in this place by the saints of this place. These are two memories from Susan Folk. The Sunday I came to Christ Church for the first time, I sat in the second to last row in the back, anticipating that I would be fumbling with the Book of Common Prayer, the bulletin, the hymnal, and not wanting to attract attention. I really wanted to be a fly on the wall that day. I lucked out in that Pat Miller was in the last row, right behind me. At one point, I was clearly befuddled, fumbling with the books and papers, when I felt a soft tap on my shoulder. I looked around and without a word, Pat pointed to what, where I needed to be without fussing around and drawing attention to the situation. It was just what I needed and my first visit led to my moving permanently from St. Mark's to Christ Church. The other saint, Lynn Jensen, has moved to Arizona but comes back to visit on occasion. At the time, we must have been serving together on the altar guild one morning and were sorting things out together in the sacristy after the service. It was a time when things at home were very, very challenging for me, and Lynn was aware of it. She gently asked me how things were going, and I totally lost it. As I wept, she gave me a big bear hug that lasted a bit longer than my usual comfort level for such things. But in retrospect, that was what was memorable for me. It was clear that she was acknowledging my pain at a deep level and was not going to allow that moment to be passed over with something like a there, there, or a pat on the back. I will always remember that. A memory from Joan Burton. Yes, thank you. Uh, A memory from Joan Burton. Ray Ray Olson volunteered in my office at the UW Retirement Center in the mid-90s. She came in every Friday morning to do clerical work and to act as a receptionist. She told me how Steve had awarded her the parish cross for her service to the church. When I told her I was attending church, in North Edmonds, she urged me to visit Christ Church just once. I did. I loved it, and I decided to join and never went back. I was invited to become a member of the tea committee. It was the custom at the Christmas tea to honor one person who over the years had given significant service. One year, I suggested Ray Olson. The award was to be a secret. I found two of her recipes for cookies to be served at the tea and baked them and set them out with the other cookies. When it was time to announce the award, Ray was not surprised. She was prepared. It was as though she knew she would be honored. So she stood up and delivered a speech about her years at Christ Church. Ray Olson loved her church and she told us why. Two memories from Natalie Johnson. 
in August. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In August of 2016, Megan was sent to the emergency room because of pain in her abdomen. The doctors quickly admitted her for observation and potentially surgery. I had just started a two-week house, house sitting gig that included care of two animals. Megan and I also have a dog and it would have been impossible for me to care for our dog and the animals I was asked to watch while house sitting with, with Megan in the hospital. Caleb and Molly offered to take our dog for as long as we needed while Megan was in the hospital. In July of 2016, my aunt and uncle were involved in a tragic car accident. My aunt Donna died on this, at the scene and my uncle, Bo uncle Bill died from complications a couple of weeks later. Julie Coriel heard about this and asked if I was going to try to make it out to Kansas City to help my cousin with the, f with the funeral and to get the house in order for selling. I told her that we were trying to find a way to make it work financially for me to go. A few days later, I received a check in the mail for $100 from Julie to be put toward a plane ticket. Without this, I would not have been able to go. A memory from Joan Bodie. A few years ago, shortly after the death of my first husband, I worked up the courage to walk into Christ Church, seeking peace in the midst of grief. The first people I saw were the Wesleys. Richard and Paula were neighbors who had moved away a few years before and we had lost touch. I wasn't even sure they were still in the area, but there they were, two friendly, loving, familiar faces, just when I needed them the most. Later that week, Paula met me for lunch. That simple act made all the difference. This is a memory from Judy Pollard. Somehow we came to church potluck with our son Gordon straight from a soccer game. He was very dirty. He changed his clothes and left his soccer shorts in the pew. <laughs> Ruth Legg came across them took them home, and washed and ironed them. They were wonderful. I asked her if she would do that every week. <laughs> she just smiled. Ruth came across as somewhat stern, but she was always good to our kids. She and her husband Dick made Christ Church their second home. These are memories from Heidi Masuko. When our family started here, Andrea Franklin was Sunday school teacher, and Vic and Nancy Turner took care of the nursery. The Sunday school kids would come up halfway through communion, and the infants would stay in the nursery until their parents retrieved them from uh, before coffee hour, giving us a break. My youngest, started at five months old and was glued to Vic Turner's lap. Sometimes when I went to get her prior to coffee hour, she wouldn't want to leave him. Ray Olson was a wonderful person who, when I joined the Altar Guild, she wasn't involved in it but had a lot to say about it anyway. <laughs> she had been very involved in it at one time. I asked her opinion about caring for the fine linens, and she told me to never, under any circumstances, dry clean or machine wash any of them. Her helpful hint was to cut a fresh slice of a juicy yellow onion to treat a scorch. Rub the onion slice juice directly all over the scorch liberally, and then re-launder the object. I have tried it three times, and it has worked every time so far. Stennis Watson's sermons were given in the slight southern drawl he had. 
They were peppered with movie themes, as he was a great movie buff. He would incorporate them into the readings of the day, as well as the hymns. That contrasted with Steve, who loved literary themes, Thomas Merton and Frederick Boschner. Stennis told me once that he, that had he had his choice, he would have been a theologian full time, writing, thinking, and commenting on Christian themes. That's probably why they got along so well. My heart misses Stennis, but we were so happy he found love at a later age and a ready-made family. He was also very supportive at the time my college senior daughter came out as a lesbian since his sister was gay as well. He provided support to me. A memory from Jocelyn Harris Gain. When I was previously on the vestry, the church needed a new roof. Carolyn Christman and I worked together on the project, which in itself was a delightful experience. Neither of us really had much of a clue how to put a new roof on the church, but we worked together to gather technical information, supplier information, and generally just stumbled through and figured it out. It was kind of scary because it was a huge dollar amount at the time. In 1997, 50,000 was a huge chunk of change. Anyway, I loved working with Carolyn, but the best part was when it came time for the work to actually take place. All the planning was done, and now it was going to happen. The beautiful sanctuary needed to be protected from all the debris that was sure to fall during a complete tear-off of the old roof. We put out a call for helpers to come on a particular day. I believe it was an early evening weekday. We didn't know how many, if any, would show up. Lo and behold, a large group of parishioners came to lovingly protect the church and encase it in plastic wrap. We were so thankful for the generosity of time and effort that everyone put in to protect the church they loved. A few memories from Rector's Aid. Kathleen Ward remembers the first Christmas tea by Jane Anderson. Jane said, by way of encouragement to the troops, we have to make this good enough for Ray Olson. <laughs> Beth Nelson reports that Ray Olson stopped driving around 2005 and had people take her to the Husky football games. And Beth took her one time and was impressed that all the people around her seats uh, knew Ray and, that, uh, she, and laughed with her and was friends with her. Many women at Rector's Aid recall that B. Jackson makes the best cookies in the world and is generous with her recipes. However, no one has been able to get the same taste that she does. I'm not going to say much because these stories do speak for themselves. And I want to leave you today with a strong sense of being perfectly balanced between the stories we hear today, which are only the slightest whisper of the goodness and love in this place over the years, and the future church that is coming into being, that right now only exists in the imagination of God, but which is coming our way. Today, our bodies, our living, breathing bodies, are right in the middle. We are surrounded by the communion of saints past and the communion of saints yet to come. We are exactly in the middle of eternity. Exactly in the middle of a story that is still being written. 
And on All Saints, we are particularly aware of it. We acknowledge, rejoice, and celebrate it today in church, but it doesn't mean it's not always happening. Wherever we are in our weeks, falling asleep alone, at work, volunteering, visiting with a friend, that communion of saints is always present showing us that we can get through this day. We can be a little softer. We can speak up a little more quickly and a little more loudly when we hear someone being degraded or our values compromised. The communion of saints is like a low hum in the background of our lives, encouraging and prodding and celebrating. And they shape us in order to welcome us into their own community. Because we too will join them someday, helping the living along through what we have left on earth, our words, our actions, through the memories that stay alive. And we especially today acknowledge how beautiful that is. This communion that God has shaped and formed that we get to participate in both living and dead. We are beautiful. <laughs>